God, we've got a bit of a time difference. So I, I really do appreciate you taking some time. Um, but yeah, let's just crack on. Let's talk about you, where you've been, what you've done, what's led you to be in, in New York. Um, tell me about yourself. Yeah. Okay. So I have been in the property industry for the past 11 years. Seems like ages. I started off back in 2009. Um, as a letting agent assistant, the only reason that I did that was because in my third year, of my second year of university, I had literally got to the end of my overdraft and was like, I need a job for the third year of my university because I could not afford to survive anymore, right? So I uh, negotiated with the lecturing staff at the University of Worcester that I would have all of my lectures on a Monday and for the rest of the week, I would then go out and find myself a pretty much full-time job. And from that, I fell into working as an admin assistant at a letting agent, which very quickly turned into just doing everything, lettings, tenancies, helping out. And the deal was I managed the, the office in the morning. So I would do like nine to one, doing all of the admin for this letting agent and organizing viewings and what have you. Then in the afternoon, I was allowed to just man the phone. So from then I'd have my lunch break, then from about two till six, I could man the phone, and my boss would let me do my coursework, which was fantastic, <laughs> as long as in the evening I went out and did the viewing. So then I would do the late night viewings as well. So it was long days, but I was getting paid a full-time salary to do my university degree as well. Thank gosh. So I got myself out of debt. During that time, um, a chap came into the office who um, needed to rent a property because it was massive snows that year and his roof had come in. Um, couldn't find him a property. He asked me instead if I'd like to babysit for his children. <laughs> wow. <laughs> cash strapped, cash strapped Natasha Collins. is like, yes, <laughs> I'm, in. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. Yeah, where do I sign up? Went and um, did a couple of babysitting for him and his wife and we got on like a house on fire and he's like, Natasha, what are you doing after university? And by that point, we just, we were coming out of the recession. I'd been applying for everything, graduate jobs, didn't really know what I wanted to do. And he said to me, Natasha, do you want to become a surveyor? I was like, uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> what on earth is a surveyor? So um, he said, go away. The next time you see me, come back armed with questions about surveyors. He said, I'm a commercial surveyor, go and find out what that is and let me know if that's of interest to you. Two weeks later, um, I come back and I'm like, sure, tell me about being a commercial surveyor. I had no other options at that time. <laughs> and he was talking to me about it and he said, look, one of my friends in London is looking for a new graduate surveyor. Um, I think you'd be really good because you're down to earth, you've got common sense, you've got a bit of a property background. Do you want to go for the interview? sure I've got nothing to lose at this point went for the interview um the guy was like okay Natasha we haven't got a position for you until September I was like perfect I am going to go traveling then for a couple of months I've saved up money I'm off to America so I'd gone to America and he had emailed me and said hey Natasha um love to have you start in September um I've also got a flat that you can rent off of me for 500 pounds per month I was like I am in <laughs> That was where my surveying journey started. I had no idea how hard it was going to be. Um, I got chucked in at the deep end. Within three months, the guy who was head of property management at the time had left. Rather than hiring someone else, they're like, Natasha, do you want to take over um, the head of property management position? Oh, wow. With Southwest <laughs> London. <laughs> portfolio. 21-year-old um, me was like, sure, I can handle it. Um, and that was where property management started. I quickly built to being an asset manager. I was um, the head of commercial property for the Sloan Stanley estate for two years. I was doing the um, property management for an NHS portfolio. I was running um, lease advisory for some of the other big portfolios in the area. And just had my fingers in so many different pies, <laughs> as well as, um, because I then was like, well, I have to become a surveyor because of this. 
I did not have the appropriate degree to become a surveyor. I had a geography and computing yeah. undergraduate degree. So I had to go and do my master's at the same time. Oh my gosh. As a conversion. So I was literally, during the day, property manager for this huge fund, then um, studying in the evenings for my master's and then doing all of the training alongside for my APC. It was wild. Um, <laughs> But that was kind of my induction into the property industry. And I learned a huge amount, number one, in having to keep myself organized because my gosh, you, like, if I think about it now, it even blows my mind how much I would have to do for all of these different property portfolios. But I would do it because every single morning I would come in, I would look at what I had on for the day, which contractors were going out to which property, were all of my tenants happy, had there been anything going on overnight, I had an out of hours call handling service, which yeah. all of you, I cannot stress it enough, if you guys decide that, and I'm not on commission for this, but <laughs> I do you who run all of the out of office for the big, big um, landlords in London also do it for the small landlords across the country. It like literally cost about £10 per property per quarter to run them on an out of hour oh, wow. system overnight. And if I didn't, have, if I wouldn't have had them, my gosh, my phone would be ringing off the hook overnight. So <laughs> like, I'd had to put in place all of these systems just to cope with the level of like email traffic and maintenance inquiries and we're looking at service charges for commercial residential well, because all of my residential was above commercial residential tenants would get seemingly wound up by the commercial tenants and vice versa so you would have to be settling those disputes as well as looking what at what your clients wanted to achieve long term so it was hectic but um I fully survived. <laughs> yeah, I survived. Very quickly had to learn how to put processes into one place for this. But because of doing that as well, one of my big clients um, took me aside one day. He's like, Natasha, you run all of these portfolios for everybody else. Why on earth are you not doing it for yourself? And I was like, really? He said, yeah, honestly, I don't understand why you haven't bought your own property. And that back in 2011, only after being doing that for 18 months, I was like, right, okay, fine. I am going to start investing in my own property portfolio. Don't know how I'm going to do it, but whatever. I'm going to buy a property. Yes. <laughs> Didn't have any money. <laughs> but I was like, well, if all these people can do it, I can do it too. Um, ended up get, putting together a bit of a business plan. Um, and convincing my parents that they needed to remortgage their property and give me 50 grand, which just looking back on it, even my parents now say, I, we have no idea how you managed to convince us to do that because it wasn't as if it was something that they could afford to do. But with that 50 grand, I took it and I bought myself a flat in Notting Hill because it was 200,000 pounds. I had completely negotiated my ass off just like this 22 year old with nothing to lose you know if I didn't get it it's not the end of the world I'm young none of my friends have ever bought property who cares um managed to get that um and that was the start of my property journey and within two years because of the way that the market had boomed in that time I remortgaged it at 320,000 pounds oh wow <laughs> my, my wow <laughs> I started my property journey so that's kind of my origin story of how I got into it and along the way I've done did my master's in surveying and then I did my APC and became a chartered surveyor and it was kind of just chucked in the deep end sink or swim learn these practices and get going I, I, honestly <laughs> like, just just hearing what you've been through in a very short period of time like in the beginning is enough to put anybody off <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds so stressful but obviously which I am going to touch on is that did come at some cost um yeah and I think at the moment as well maybe a lot of people might um resonate with that obviously you are a mental health ambassador and um lion is it lion heart lion yeah lion heart you um are an ambassador for them do you want to tell people obviously that situation had its consequences how you realize that what's changed and how it's kind of got you to where you are now yes so 
a big consequence of all of that that I was doing was burnout. I, mm. There's no way that's sustainable. That lifestyle is a lot. Even thinking back on it, I've now managed to kind of take um, twist the thought process around it from one of ne absolute negativity to one of okay that happened and this is what I've learned from it um so I was literally getting up six o'clock in the morning getting to the gym doing an hour in the gym being at my desk by um 8 30 ish working the whole day through to about 6 30 running home because I thought I needed to exercise twice a day then doing my um studying up until about 10 o'clock at night 11 o'clock at night if it was a um if it was an assignment time, I'd be up till midnight and I'd just go again. And I did that for four years. And that was not sustainable. So by the time I got around to taking my APC the first time round, which for people who don't know, it's your assessment of professional competence. And that is your um, final exam to become a chartered surveyor. I walked into the room. Um, and also during this final year where I was about to take my APC, my parents had started their divorce process. And I was mediating on that. So I was separating out the assets. Um, Chris and I, we just bought our first property together. Like there was so much going on in my life. And I'd gone into my APC the first time round and um, got halfway through and couldn't do it anymore. I just sat there literally crying. It was like I was being attacked. I've never felt like that before. And after it was over, I was like, okay, well, got to go home now couldn't get home i was on the phone to my dad i was like i don't know how to get home he's like where are you I said somewhere near heathrow couldn't get home couldn't think about anything that was going on um and i obviously didn't pass you find out seven days later i hadn't passed and i was angry i was angry at myself i was angry at the world i was angry at everything that was going on and i wasn't sleeping properly and i wasn't doing this and i failed everything that i'd done i completely fa failed um and luckily the racs noticed and put me in contact with lionheart who is the charity that supports surveyors and their families and they said natasha please get in contact with them like, every time we've seen you up until about the last six months you've been so excited so happy so bubbly and something has just completely knocked you off kilter i found lion heart in tears not knowing what to expect and told them what had been going on i felt baby see it this has happened there um and they took me under their wing and gave me six months worth of counseling and helped me be kinder to myself look after myself so that i could go back into my apc the second time round and pass it it wasn't that i it, it was never that I wasn't a competent surveyor. It was that I would completely burnt myself out through all of this stuff that I was doing. And that was kind of the life changing moment. If you, if you see, because I'd taken too much on, I wasn't doing anything efficiently and I had to still do everything that was going on in my life. It's not like you could just give it up. Um, I still had to do that and still could, continue being a surveyor and continue running my property portfolio and continue doing all of that but I had to now do it on a more efficient efficient way possible so that was where the processes started coming in um, and on the back of that I said to them well it can't just be me in this situation we're in a high pressured industry you know people aren't always that nice to you you have to go and negotiate with to, with people and they can be pretty hard nosed right yes definitely <laughs> <laughs> Do you know you come up, okay, you've, we've had this conversation where we say we come up, we come up against people and we're like are you kidding me right now <laughs> could you I not just buy a house please let me buy one <laughs> i'm trying to give you money not take it <laughs> <laughs> i want to negotiate with you i just want this to happen and i want this to be easy and you know we come up against lenders and you look at lenders sometimes you're like are you are you for real right now like we've been through all of these hoops and you've still come up with something else <laughs> it's like you get it right daily well, you know i'm just so fortunate my husband deals with all of our mortgages because literally i think if i if i had to i would have left the property game along like when i first started it would just 
it's just not for me it's very frustrating it's so like antiquated it's just it's just not it's it's his, his department <laughs> but it will stay there until it goes all online <laughs> Chris does not want to get involved in mortgages whatsoever. He's like, no thanks, I'm not having that. Um, and I, but they're so bloody minded. I mean, one bridging lender got my completion statement wrong four times on exchange, so I had to pull out and lost a load of money, and then sued me because I pulled out. So I had to counter sue them. Oh my yeah. gosh! I don't have that touch wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well fingers crossed i'm just so livid livid but it's all of these things that come up on you on a daily basis mm -hmm. and it could be that you're dealing with someone on a bad day it could be that you're dealing with somebody who doesn't respect what you're doing it could be that you just come up against people who are just awful right that's the long and short of it and it's also cutthroat. We do work a lot of hours. You know, as much as you can streamline stuff, if you're on the lookout for another property or you're trying to figure out your strategy to growth or you're trying to deal with tenants' lease renewals or, my gosh, all you commercial landlords or commercial property managers, when it's service charge time of the year and we're doing budgets and we're doing reconciliation statements and we're trying to get contractors' quotes, my gosh, like, it's frustrating. Rent review negotiations. <laughs> oh, I can't forget the brick wall sometimes like, all of these things it couldn't have just been me and so I said to Lionheart should we do something should we actually do something let's start a movement in the industry let's start educating people about mental health because I am a naturally anxious person if I allow myself to be it's been like that for over 20 years I can remember it goes and I just worry about things but I can I can see when it's happening now and I can get a hold on it and Lionheart have really helped with me with that as well but there will be people who are in much worse situations than I am or people who experience things differently and so if we had a place where we could bring people together and we could talk about well-being and we could talk about mental health that gives people a platform to know that it's okay just because you deal with something differently than someone else doesn't mean that you're incompetent and sometimes that seems to come across and especially in the surveying industry I mean it happens in the property industry as well but sometimes you come across other surveyors and you think why would you why would you even treat me like that like what, what why and it's just because we have different attitudes of coming across people and it's the same in the, pro in the investment industry as well we have different attitudes but it doesn't make me wrong it doesn't make you wrong it doesn't make anybody else wrong it just means that we're different people and so having this space where we could come together and we go through some tips some tools some techniques um the things that are working for me at the time the things that aren't working for me at the time the things that are working for other people because well-being is a practice it's a journey we constantly have to work on it it's not like you do it one day and you're like <laughs> feeling happy now that's me for life no. <laughs> doesn't happen like that so that was where I started working fly and heart and we roll those um they start off as workshops and when I was in the UK they were always workshops yeah. and there'd be hours and we'd I'd do supercharge your well-being which is my signature signature one we would do boosting your resilience and um supercharging your confidence as well but now I'm I just head up to the supercharge your well-being we do them online um, and I do them for students and young surveyors older surveyors um and it's just a place to help. And it's something that we need to really focus on because for everybody, no matter where you are, the industry can be tough. So it's oh, no, definitely. And I can completely resonate with where you're coming from. Um, I have a life coach. She's, I've been working with her now for probably five, yeah, five years. Um, and I wouldn't have been able to get through the time I have if I hadn't have changed my mindset. But like you say, that first year I did it every, you know, literally had a session every week. She's based in Australia, she's amazing. We do Zoom or WhatsApp calls. Um, literally did it every every week for, for 12 months. Obviously there's a big cost to that, but I'm a completely different person. And even now to this day, I still have to revisit them first sessions. You know, I've got everything written down. 
spending time looking after myself, affirmation. I know people do, not everyone can resonate with that. But for me, it, it, it really changed my life. And if I hadn't have done that, I probably would be on a completely different path now. So I'm completely with you on, on anything to do with mindset. It's really Oh my gosh. So important. I can't stress it enough. I'm the same with you. Always working with the coach. Just someone who just puts you back in line. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so like, Go back. <laughs> Where are you going with that? <laughs> Maybe that's a different podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> well, for me, your energy is so infectious, and that's what drew me to you um, over social media. Um, obviously, you help others. You've got an amazing platform to do that. So do you, will you share with people, obviously, you wanting to help people leverage the time a bit better, be systemized, can you explain what it is you offer and how it can help people who are listening? Yeah, so I um, I run a, a platform called the NC Real Estate Members Club. And that is my online community. It's a paid for community. Obviously, there's a free stuff out there. So just to start with, if you're getting to know me, there is a lot of the free stuff out there. My Property Investment Mastery Facebook group is always the first touch point or Instagram, Natasha C. Collins. Like those places are just really good for like a good overview of what I do. But inside the members club, I put all of the processes for both commercial and residential property that I have used and still use to this day. If anybody saw my, Insta my Instagram feed yesterday, of a picture of me sat on the terrace doing my end of year accounts and getting all my bookkeeping done. <laughs> That's, a, that's purely through the systems that I've created over, over the years to streamline everything. And what I do in the members club is I put that all together and we do that in monthly packages. And my whole ethos is that all of the learning that you do should be in about 15 minutes with processes alongside it. And those processes either come in the form of a workbook, which makes you think, because obviously strategy is um, very much individual to your, your property, but it also gives you the processes that you go through to get to that point. For example, if we were to do a commercial investment valuation, what do we start with? Well, we start with what's the rental that's coming in. So how much rent are you getting? Is this at market value or could you raise that to market value? So then we do the research around what market value is. We then look at lease terms. Well, you have to look at the lease terms from where you come, come from, but then you have to also start forecasting. Well, actually, what can we do going forward? So I give you the things that you need to look at, but also the things that are just rinse and repeat where you get the information from so that you can complete your valuations. I do that with property management record systems. This month, we've got the property management record system package, which is where you literally click it four times, put it in your Google Drive, and you've got all the processes and everything for this property management record. <laughs> Right? That's, that's it. Like simple things that create huge results because my main driver for growth in property portfolios is strategy and how we can increase the rent and how we can increase the value of properties. It's not, I, I really hate this, this passive kind of investment strategy where you buy a property, you negotiate on it, on it you sit on it for two years, you remortgage out of it you haven't done anything. Whereas I think to be a property investor, you have to be quite active. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how many properties you've got, because again, it's quality over quantity. If you can make your desired income from three properties rather than 25, go with the three. Like, I don't know why you would You can do that when you come back to London. In Sheffield, it's a different scenario. Yeah, no, I, I get that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm like, I, my investor, because I've always got so much going on, for me personally, my investment strategy is the minimum amount of pro properties for the maximum amount of income, right? That's, that's, I have to rely on that because I love the teaching side of things that I do. I never want to give that up because I love, interacting with people <laughs> so right, like, that, that for me is my trade-off right so so what I do within the members club is give you the plat give you the stuff to work 
from all of the processes and then we have drop-in sessions on zoom where we get to we get together as a group and then we have one-to-ones which are just 30 minutes each month and i make sure that people are on track and the reason that i did this was because I know from when I was building my, por my portfolio in my early 20s, how important it was to have experts around me. Now, I was lucky in the, in the fact that I had estate managers, right, who, who owned millions of pounds of property and have been building that over the years and I had estate managers for the NHS who would have a completely different viewpoint on it and then I would have the solicitors for these um, portfolios as well one of whom is, is still my solicitor to this day because she will always say to me all right I get you on this I do not get you on that I have no idea what you're doing <laughs> Oh, okay. So she's like, are you sure this makes sense? But the one thing that she never says to me is no, there's always a workaround between the pair of us, we can solve things. And we've been doing that for what, 10 years now from when we were, she, she was a solicitor, still is a solicitor for the NHS portfolio. We would always come up with a solution and it didn't necessarily need to, to look like perfect solution you know but we'd we'd agree things we'd think about it and we'd go all right we'll give it a, we'll give it a shot but having a great team around you is so important so, and that's where the members club comes in because i wanted to be that team member for other people mm. you know if, if you need that support and i've always had this ethos with my clients i will walk to the end of the world for you you know what do you need to go into battle for mm. i'm going to make sure that you get the best out of it without screwing anybody else over we that's got to be how we work in the, in the property industry i'm not out for blood i'm out to make sure that you get the best possible results but that everybody in in the deal is happy and i that's that's where the passion comes from there's always a solution the strategy may not look like what you wanted it to look like at the start who cares if we get to the end result and everybody gets what they need gets what they want my gosh we have done what we set out to do right you you know that yeah but it's all about your team it's all about the tools you've got in your toolbox if you don't have them tools then someone else in your team has got them and i think that's why what you're doing is is really valuable to other people um and especially that monthly accountability checking up are you okay what's you know have you got any issues which um i'm sure a lot of people do at this time if we're honest yeah. and can i I'm going to put it out there um, that we, do, we currently don't have many properties within my clients, the members club who's vacant. And if they are vacant, it's for a reason. Right? <laughs> it's for a very tactical reason. It's because we, we focused on really what can we do to help our tenants during this time? What can we do to help the industry during this time? It's not perfect. Nothing's perfect. It's wild out there. We've never, like, I can't tell you when this is going to end. <laughs> you know but you can only deal with what you know in the in the situation in the kind of remit that we're in right now and that's and if people and it i'm very good at checking with people i mean there's a couple of members out there who will know i remember what's in their leases as well <laughs> got the memory of an elephant there's no escaping there's no escaping i remember <laughs> that's the service that I offer I, and uh, it's great because we get strategic and members feed off each other's ideas and inspiration it's not com it's not a competitive environment it's okay well I've been here or I've been doing this or I've been doing all of these different things and, and it's kind of inspiring for each other which I love it honestly it's like such it's, ah, it's a passion of mine I love it just can, honestly like just by you talking about it you can see you really can it's um it's very yes yeah, it's, it's so nice to see it's so infectious <laughs> uh, we're going to put all the details um in the podcast in the show notes where everyone can contact you if they want to get involved with the members club and um, how they can kind of start that process because it's not just uh, anyone can Mm -hmm. walk in the door it there is a bit of a process to it so um, we'll pop all the details in there yeah obviously we need to talk about COVID-19 <laughs> um, 
I know you'll be doing, you've got a great document that you've got that's um, been updated yeah. really regular. Um, so we'll pop the link in as well for people to get in contact with that. Um, what have you changed in your business, if anything? So obviously you are more or less, you are, everything is online for you. Um, yeah. How has it affected you or going forward? Do you see any, any opportunities? What does it look like to you? Um, so I had to make changes in regards to my service accommodation. I have one service accommodation and obviously about start of March, everybody started cancelling and I was like, oh Jesus, I just done a refurb on this service accommodation <laughs> <laughs> and it was beautiful. I would honestly like I'd put in the, the bathroom of my dreams and I'd literally, I'd, I'd, it was do it. It was do it. So don't get me wrong. This wasn't just me spending money for the sake of spending money. This was on my maintenance cycle. I was going to do it anyway, but I was really hoping that this year was going to be the year that I could put my prices up. Well, obviously that didn't happen. Um, so I kind of, that was, the, that was a real kind of like, okay, what do I do now? So I figured, well, I can't be the only one with this issue, but I've now got to start experimenting. So I listed it just on um, open rent. I put it on spare room, put it on gum tree, just to see if anybody would want it. Um, and I just said, look, I'm not there right now. If you want this property, you're going to have to book it through Airbnb. Yeah. I mean, I can't do anything else. My, I do have a managing agent down there. But at the same time, I was being a bit stingy and was like, can I do this myself? Like the cleaners have been in there. They've completely cleaned it out. It's got all bedding. It's literally turnkey. No one has to bring anything with them apart from the suitcase of clothes. Fine. Um, then what happened was um, a couple got in contact with me and said, hey, my daughter is stuck in the UK. Uh, can she rent it for a month until we can get her home? So that was great. So that was a month long booking. Fantastic. Um, got that then I had um these Chinese students three Chinese girls got in contact with me and said uh Natasha seen your advert on spare room would really like to book your place for the rest of the summer can we do that through Airbnb yes but that was the week that the government stopped accepting bookings on Airbnb mm -hmm. so I had to phone Airbnb and be like look can you just overrule this please these these and they were like no we can't because of your government i was like these children are gonna have nowhere to live <laughs> just made it into this massive drama but they didn't have anywhere to live the like, university of bath didn't really have any accommodation for them they were cramped in close quarters this property was going to be empty that was the only way i was going to be able to do it and luckily airbnb allowed that to happen so That's really good got them in till july we'll see what happens in july i am um you can't worry about something until something happens. Like, I can't. So I've got no mortgage holidays. I'm still lucky enough to be able to pay for everything. And that's been a real positive um, thing. Do I, what do I think is going to change? Um, I think anybody who's selling their property right now is probably doing it out of desperation. Mm -hmm. um, so there may be deals to be had, but be careful mortgage lenders saying really strange things at the moment i know a lot of <laughs> i've never heard of like <laughs> most of the stuff that they're coming out with right now um i know some of my members they send me through things so i look at it and i'm like oh it's coming and it's getting a bit weird like trying um debating where funds have come from from deposits and things um some mortgage lenders are doing really well though uh, anybody who's getting mortgages i think from the mortgage works right now seem to still be shifting I think we've got one through that actually a recent one yeah i i just renegotiated a mortgage for my mom for the mortgage works um which went through 23rd of april they halved the interest rate and they gave her ten thousand pounds based upon some valuations that they went out and did of this property fantastic great thank you very much glad that went through <laughs> so so some lenders are lending some lenders aren't lending the more specialist lenders are really struggling right now um and i think we'll, we'll continue to see that commercial lenders 
have pulled in their loan for values. So some of them have, some of them haven't. Their interest rates have gone up. Obviously, the reason for that is because commercial tenants aren't paying as much as they were. It's all like fine. You know, we. I mean, we're really it. lucky. We're really lucky. I mean, we've got a new build project which is completely funded by investor private finance. Um, we nearly went down the development finance route, but we didn't because this investor came in at the last minute. Otherwise, that would be completely different. And we've got two commercial, but it's an unencumbered property. So, touch wood, oh. we've just been super lucky. How's your commercial tenants doing? What are what type of tenants are they? Uh, so, one is a carpet um, company, so a flooring company. Obviously, he can't work at the moment, really. Um, his wife just had a baby, so he can't really go into other people's properties and he can't anyway, really, unless it's a mm -hmm. vacant um, buy to let or that type of uh, investment. He does all of our properties and at the minute he just won't come and do them in case he Fine. takes anything home, which is fair enough. But um, he's paid his rent for the last two months. Um, everyone just paid what we are now the fourth. Most of them paid on the first, got two that pay on the fifth. Everyone's paid. Um, the other one is like um, an American sweet shop where he's due on the 5th, so we shall see. But he, he has said, look, if I can't pay, I'll pay as much as I can and then we'll just work it out after. So, you oh, know. Well, you can't argue with that, can you? No, we, do you know, we've just, been, we've just been in contact with his tenants and at, at this time, communication has got to be number one because if you don't speak to them, They'll go off the radar. You'll just not hear from them. And that's not what we didn't want that. We didn't want them to think we weren't approachable. So yeah, no, that's what we've done anyway. That's such a good point, isn't it? And some tenants as well, commercial tenants don't realise how much support and help is out there for them. Oh God, know? a carpet fitter literally has got all sorts, all yeah. sorts of different loans. And we were like, yeah. please don't ever turn around and say you can't afford to pay your rent after what you've just told us. It's no, silly. no. Exactly, yeah. In fact, pay it all up front. We'll have it. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the year. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we'll take that, thanks. <laughs> Recap it for you for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But no, he's, really, he's been there quite a while. He's a really good tenant, so we're lucky. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, th I think as well, once we get out, out of this, probably September time, I'm going to go and look for commercial units again. In fact, I've been looking at commercial auctions. And there's some really interesting deals out there. There's a lot of sale and leasebacks going on, which means that commercial tenants or commercial operators who would usually have um, owned their own properties to raise cash are selling the properties on these great leases that they are yeah. staying in the properties for probably not as high rent as you'd expect to get but definitely worth a look for, for me um i don't have any investors actually who would lend money for the mortgage for the auction this week um but definitely i've had in, my investors get in contact with me I've, my business partner back in the UK and text me, Natasha, we've got money lined up for the for the end of August. What what are we buying? I'm thinking, Ooh. so people still want to get involved in deals. And I think whatever commercial tenants get through this, so they survive, great tenants. I would happily have them in my portfolio. People are still going to need to be renting property. We still see that people are renting property because I know that tenants are moving in and out there's um lots of demand not lots of demand right if you if you say people that need to move. People, people need to move if you say that you're going to have your property on the market for 30 days regularly and you budget for that well maybe now it might take 90 days to two months uh, not 90 days no 45 days to two months ish you know so you just budget for that extra void period it, things are moving slower but that's because there's not as many market players out there so um, I think we'll see a dip in the market, but hopefully by the end of the year, we should have flattened back out. I know there's, a lot, I see some very doomsday posts out there. Oh gosh, I, I'll be honest with you. I've completely switched off to a lot of it. I, I just don't need that negativity in my life. You know, we all know what's going on. We all are affected. Everyone's going to be affected by it in some shape or form. But I just, I've kind of battened down the hatches. <laughs> well, it goes it goes back to the saying doesn't it 
what can you control? If you have an empty property and you're thinking to yourself, well, I've seen all of these posts, like landlords are really struggling and I can't, tenants can't move in and out and this, that and the other. You start thinking to yourself, well, it's not possible to let it. I'm going to start having to fold because of X, Y, and Z. But then if you take a step back, shut that off, as you said, and start thinking, well, what can I do? Well, I can still list my property. Fantastic. I list my property in as many places as possible. That gives me more of a fighting chance for people to come and take it on. We just got to do the things that we can control. Last Thursday, I um, advertised one of our properties, well, um, <coughs> one of the properties that we have. And uh, Thursday, it didn't even go into right move. Saturday, I sent all the videos, all the images. They said, look, we, we really want it, but we just need to physically come and check it out. So I said, look, I could open the door. You've got PPE. I, I was in the car while I didn't show them around. Obviously, we followed up on the phone after and they've taken it. The references have just come back today and they're like, we're moving at the weekend. Um, yeah, perfect. So people, people still want to move. Obviously, it is necessary for them to move. Um, but, you know, I got an absolute barrage of abuse for doing that. And I, I did a, a video just to show that obviously people still want to let, you know, people want to move. Um, obviously, it's got to be essential. And yet got an absolute barrage of it from letting ag other letting agents. And they were all letting agents. Yeah. Um, oh. so I, I don't know. I feel in this time we should all be supporting each other, but maybe in some areas in property, that's not the case. <laughs> not that they weren't that good, right. <laughs> but yeah, um, do you know, it, it is where it is. <laughs> You're not putting yourself in any danger. You're oh, not no. spreading the virus. There you go. You know, you have to, you can't just give up. My gosh, the minute you give up, everything exactly. falls down. Exactly. But yeah. So going into, well, going end of this year, what's the plans? What are you looking forward to? What have you got in your pipeline? Ooh, I have got so many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> So what are we doing? Um, April was kind of, for me, it was just a month going back to coaching and I hired a couple of new team members at NC Real Estate. So we've been doing onboarding and that's been phenomenal. I've been learning so much about onboarding new team members and what have you. Um, what are we doing? Well, this month we're launching the Members Club again. So the doors are opening. That is from the 18th to the 21st of May. We've got a whole launch se sequence going to get very exciting over the next couple of weeks. So looking forward to that. Then we kind of during the summer, I mean, I had loads of live events planned this year and I do live events in the UK and not been able to do that so I'm hoping that come um around September time I'll be able to start getting those back in the diary again um I've got uh my commercial property mastermind opening up again at the end of the year I've got some smaller packaged products that will be coming out at the end of the summer um and then hopefully as of September um back to investing oh and I, we've got um uh oh. development Oh, I was just thinking, I've got development over in Jersey, which would be selling at the end of the summer. That's exciting. That would oh. be my first flip. Oh, wow. So super, super busy. But, well, yes, but it's organised. So, like, <laughs> it's systemised and outsourced. <laughs> systemised, outsourced. Things are, look, again, all I can do is what I can control. The outcome is whatever the outcome will be but we just we just try and plan throughout the year to keep busy and keep everything going and you know that's that's what i enjoy doing we've got um yeah I'm, i've always got things going on but i enjoy it like that way <laughs> hopefully when things open i can book a holiday or something you know well, thank you so much for your time tonight. It's been it's been great speaking to you. You've got so much knowledge and experience and really your energy is so infectious. So everyone who's watching, um, I'll pop Natasha's details in the Facebook pages and on the podcast. Um, all the details will be in the show notes. Make sure you connect with her on social media. So I'll put all the links in there. And yeah, thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Laura. It's been fabulous.